Hi, welcome to the analysis.news. I'm Paul Jay. And in a few seconds, we're going to continue our series of interviews with Bill Black on what he calls controlled fraud, and especially with the, what led up to the financial crash of 2007, 2008. And, and we'll bring it up soon to today because ain't that much has changed. Uh, so we'll be back in a second. Please don't forget there's a donate button at the top of the web page and the subscribe button at, on YouTube. And the best way to grow this site is to share. So just share this with a couple of people every time you watch something and help us grow. So we're continuing our series of interviews with Bill Black on control fraud. And the, we started with the savings and loan uh, crisis in the 80s, or f fraud <laughs> in the 80s. And now we're up to around the period leading up to the 07 08 crash, especially these years, uh, 2003 to 2006. And before we get to Bill, uh, once again, there's a docu series titled The Con, which breaks down very well what happened during these years leading up to and during 07 08. Uh, here's another trailer from the film. So part of the problem is this handful of institutions, uh, large banks that were so big and so interconnected that the failure of any one of which had the capacity to bring down the financial system, too big to fail banks. And what happened in the run up to the financial crisis is that these institutions um, had a huge amount of exposed risk into one area, the mortgage market. Mortgage, mortgages, mortgage-backed securities, and these really esoteric securities that were created out of the mortgage-backed securities. CDOs, synthetic CDOs, the sort of alphabet soup of products that all of these big banks were all exposed to at the same time. And so how does that translate into a financial crisis? Well, normally, if a bank um, has very, very little of their own money, is borrowing 97, 98% of their money, and only has a couple percent of their own money at risk, and are taking huge, huge risky positions. At some point, lenders would stop lending the money. We're not gonna lend you any more money because our money is gonna be at risk. But that doesn't happen in Too Big to Fail because the market all presumes, and it, as we learned in 2008, presumed very correctly, that if any one of these institutions were to suffer those losses, um, they're still gonna be able to pay back everyone because the government's gonna step in and bail them out and cover all those debt payments. And so the normal functions of capitalism, which would say, hey, giant bank, you're not allowed to borrow anymore. You need to get out of these markets where you're exposed to all of this, this, this massive mortgage risk. Like, that didn't happen. And so what happened is you had this giant bubble that was created by a lot of fraudulent activity, making you know, huge profits with little regard or worry about what would happen if the other shoe drops because they were confident and the market was confident that the government would bail them out. And that's just a toxic cocktail. And so when these mortgages inevitably started failing uh, because they were so riddled with fraud, because they were not well underwritten, uh, because they were in many cases predatory and f almost forced onto people who could never possibly afford to pay them, it was inevitable it was going to collapse. And when it collapsed, what started as a snowball turned into a giant avalanche. Um, and all of these institutions were so interconnected to one another that they started to fail. And so when these organizations were on the, these banks were on the verge of failure, they turtle up, right? They stopped lending. And all of a sudden, if you have an economy where nobody is lending anymore, everything seizes up, that's what drives a financial crisis. Um, companies can't borrow to, 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 you know, to, to run their businesses. Um, people can't borrow money to buy homes anymore. And with that, you have this contraction in the economy, a contraction in demand, and you have what you had in 2008, a massive financial crisis with a massive recession that was attached to it um, as a result of the, the greed of these institutions um, and the structural problems that allowed for the creation of institutions that are so big and so interconnected that no matter how bad their decisions were, we as the American people had to come to the rescue and, and bail them out. So now joining us to discuss the history and present state of what he calls control fraud is Bill Black, who's in the film and was an advisor to its producers. Bill's an American lawyer, academic author, and a former bank regulator with expertise in white collar crime, public finance, and regulation. He's the author of the book, The Best Way to Rob a Bank is to Own One, and he's an associate professor of economics and law 
at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. Thanks very much for joining us again, Bill. Thank you. So, so let's pick up the story. Uh, sort of, I think we we got into two thousand three, two thousand and six, and I had been asking you how significant to the crash uh, was the repackaging of all this by by the big banks. All this being. Uh, what was called toxic assets, liars, loans that were packaged in enormous quantities together and then resold by the big banks in New York to banks all over the world, even to other banks in New York, but to pension funds and and, and you name it, all sold as being uh, reliable investments, which was all part of the fraud. So I guess pick up the story. Okay, so uh, again, the key is exponential growth. And that exponential growth, when you start out really small, which is this one survivor, AmeriQuest, in 1994 going to the shadow, well, it's growing really rapidly, 50% a year, but it's a small institution. So this is the blade of the hockey stick period, right? Where it looks like, yeah, the problem's expanding, but you know, it can't become a crisis, right? And then a whole bunch of other uh, lenders follow the same tactic. Plus, you simply get large enough that 50% growth is huge growth. And this is the period 2003 through 2006 that is the hyperinflation of a housing bubble. This is when the bubble goes absolutely crazy. This is when the growth of fraudulent loans almost entirely explains the growth of the housing market, right? Liars loans, which have a 90% fraud incidence, according to the industry's own anti-fraud experts in their 2006 report to the industry, grow by over 500% in three years. They become the dominant form. That means over a million, well over a million Liars loans are made every year with, again, with a 90% fraud incidence. So over a million fraudulent loans. Really quickly, just in case there's some people that didn't listen to me when I said, go back, maybe I forgot to say it this time, go back and watch the first parts of the series because all this will make more sense. But just in case, uh, again, quickly, what's a, what is the liar's loan? What are, what are these predatory loans? Okay, so liar's loan is not the same as predatory. Uh, but that's a good thing to bring up. So liar's loan is when you don't verify the borrower's income. Sometimes they didn't verify even their job. Sometimes they didn't verify even their assets. So that was called a no income, no job, no asset, a ninja loan uh, within the trade, right? Uh, and there are actual ads with the three monkeys, the three monkeys, right? Standing for see no evil, hear no evil. So you don't usually in advertising want to associate yourself with the concept of evil, but that was the ads <laughs> that Greenpoint used to get the idea across. Yes, folks, we are here to lie, to help you to lie. We will buy all the crappy liar's loans that you can poss possibly induce people uh, to do. All right. So this is nuts, right? No honest lender would do this because, of course, if the borrower's income is massively inflated, then the borrower is much more likely to default on the loan, right? But the idea is to fraudulently make the loan appear particularly safe, particularly non-risky. And so if I inflate the borrower's income and the average was to inflate the borrower's income by more than 50%, then I can make a loan that's going to be a disaster look like it is a prime rose. And I can get paid a premium uh, in the markets in these circumstances. Similarly, how do I make a loan that's really massively fraudulent look particularly safe? I extort the appraiser to dramatically inflate the appraisal. Then I can make a larger loan. I get bigger fees for all of that and bigger fees when I sell it. Now, if you know nothing about the great financial crisis, but think you know, <laughs> then you've been told this is all about the secondary market sales, 
right? That they have no skin in the game, nothing to lose, the loan originator, because he's just going to sell the crap to other people. But there are two, you know, catastrophic problems with that lie. One is, well, in fact, they did have skin in the game. Right? Um, all the contracts still provided that they had skin in the game. And indeed, they failed because they had skin in the game. But remember, the failure of the bank is not a failure of the fraud scheme. Because again, the title from the two Nobel laureates in economics, George Akerlof and Paul Romer in 1993, agreeing with us about what the fraud scheme was driving the savings and loan debacle was looting the economic underworld of bankruptcy for profit. The Bank will fail, but the people that run the bank will get very rich. Okay, so the first problem is actually they always did have skin. The second problem is what if they had no skin? We're supposed to believe that everybody in finance is so stupid about finance that they can't figure out the perverse incentive you would have if you had no skin in the game. Whereas you're taught in finance from day one that it's the most important thing. So it, it's a nutso thing. There is no such thing as a fraud exorcist. Once you originate, that means make fraudulent loans, you can't make them unfraudulent, right? They will forever be fraudulent. They will transmit through the system. And that means to sell fraudulent loans, you have to make additional fraud. You have to make fraudulent representations and warranties, or reps and warranties, as they're called in the trade, to the buyer. Because, you you know, it's a stunning thing. You can't go to buyers and say, hi, I want to sell you fraudulent loans. That doesn't work. Right? So here you have to pretend that you are making the loans in accordance with your loan, your written loan standards. When, of course, you're doing nothing in accordance with those loan standards, and that's called fraud. So, yes, there is fraud in the secondary sales, but then you have to ask yourself, well, why are buyers buying stuff that everybody knows is massively fraudulent? Everybody in the industry knows. Hell, the industry calls them liars' loans. That lacks a certain subtlety as a fraud scheme, right? <laughs> you know, this is not hard. This isn't even, you know, fraud 101. This is fraud one, right? Uh, so how, why are they willing to buy it? Why does this fraud, same fraud scheme work for the originator, the person that makes the loan, and the buyer? So just one second. These buyers are sophisticated organizations, people that run pension funds, people that run banks. These are not, you know, didn't come off the street and get sold something. They are, in fact, overwhelmingly the most financially sophisticated people in the world. Because while you're right that pension funds would buy some of these things, the original buyer almost always was an investment bank. And the investment banks, these are folks that get paid $250,000 plus bonuses their day out of school because they're allegedly, you know, the creme de la creme of the world. And they have all the sophisticated research departments and such. So they all know this is crap. But as long as nobody says it's crap, all of us, all the officers in this chain this food chain that, as you see, extends and then extends beyond this, because then we got to get into financial derivatives off of these. We're just talking about mortgage-backed securities right now, but then mortgage-backed securities are in financially engineered into CDOs, collateralized debt obligations, and then they are supposedly backed by credit default swaps. So there's level after level after level. And at every level, as long as we follow the financial version of don't ask, don't tell, and pretend that pure crap is AAA, then all of us get immense fees. Now, the firms are going <laughs> to lose huge amounts. Pension funds, if they buy it, German cities, little banks, state-owned banks in Germany. Yes, 
the fraudulent resale of mortgages doesn't add to the amount of fraudulent underlying loans, but it redistributes the losses. And it can redistribute those losses in ways that are really important and really painful to lots of folks. But there's actually just a, in the scope we're talking about, a relatively tiny amount of absolutely new product created in this derivative process, which is itself also fraudulent. And, and those are called synthetics, right? So in addition to regular CDOs and CDO squared and CDO cubed, which are monumentally more insane, right? Just to make sure, for someone who doesn't know what a CDO is at all, 30 seconds, what is a CDO? Whoa. <laughs> all right, a minute. You take the cash flow for mortgages. Mortgages provide cash, right? When we pay our monthly fee or if we prepay our mortgage, usually when we refinance or sell the home, right? That cash flow is allocated on a tiered basis. In other words, different priorities among different kinds of investors. And 80% of them are at the top and they get, you know, first dibs on the cash flow, right? So that's how a CDO works. It takes many, many mortgage-backed securities. In fact, the estimate is that it has over a billion pages of legal documentation once you do get up to a CDO squared, which is to say no one, of course, ever reads all the crap in this because no one needs to. Again, it's financial version of don't ask, don't tell. As long as you pretend this stuff has value, we all got our fees. And again, the best estimate of fees involved in all of these kinds of mortgage paper. Everything we're discussing is a variant of mortgage paper were $2 trillion. So tons and tons of elite white collarish folks that look like me, <laughs> <you know? laughs> except they dress a lot better <laughs> in more expensive suits, made millions each out of this. And so are you going to say, uh, oh, excuse me, <laughs> none of this is real. This is going to be a disaster. Um, we shouldn't sell this to pension funds and such. Um, not so much, huh? Okay, synthetics. Then the gravy train stops. So synthetics, even weirder. I can create what is allegedly the same kind of risk as a CDO by doing yet another instrument called a credit default swap. Now, credit default swaps are fake insurance. And you short, you can use them to short securities. And so you can create sort of an analog to the risk of a CDO by using CDS. And again, CDS, credit default swaps, are what destroy AIG, the largest insurance company in the world, which of course all of us as taxpayers uh, got to uh, bail out, but we left the upside overwhelming to AIG's owner, not to the American people, of course. So th there were some actual increases of exposure through the creation of the synthetics, but in the grand scheme of things, they were tiny compared to everything else. So again, overwhelmingly, the secondary market is not the cause. And indeed, in many countries, such as Ireland, where they had a bubble that relative to GDP, um, residential bubble, was more than twice as large as that of the United States. And they had simultaneously a commercial real estate bubble, and there was virtually no secondary market sales. You can keep the alternative is to simply keep it in portfolio. You keep owning it and you keep overstating its value. And then all you have to do is grow rapidly. Duh. Well, you know, how hard is that with deposit insurance? When, when they deregulated interest rates under Carter and Reagan, they probably inadvertently, though you never know fully, created a catastrophic system where any bank with insurance, federal insurance, could grow 
to virtually unlimited amounts. Because if we're fully insured by the federal government, what do we care about the quality of the bank? All they have to do is offer us an extra 15 basis points. That's, you know, 15 one hundredths of 1% of interest more. And our loan broker, our deposit brokers will automatically shift it to that bank. And the next day, that teeny tiny bank will have $4 billion more or 40 billion or 400 billion, right? So we supercharge this fraud scheme. So if I'm getting this right, let me actually, let me just say this. If you're watching and listening, and you're finding all this var various derivatives and CDOs and synthetics, if you're finding all that hard to understand and confusing, that's the point. It's supposed to be hard to understand and confusing for ordinary people. It's supposed to just be these financial geniuses that actually understand it. But the real point, it's all built on a foundation of fraud, which you can understand, which is your uh, inflating people's incomes, you're inflating the value of the property. And then the financial sector is figuring out a way to skin that cat once, twice, three, four times. Am I getting at it? Every at, at, at every step. At every every step of I, the process. And let me correct something I just said, because while it's happening within financial institutions, as Bill keeps reminding me, the profits going to the individual bankers and the institutions themselves while they're at risk, well, it turns out they're not really at risk because they, they bloody control the federal government and they wind up on the whole getting bailed out anyway. L before we get to that part, though, let me just ask you, while it's pretend it's all real, it's, 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 it's that there's a very important actor that you just mentioned the name of in this theater, and that's AIG and the rating companies who are insuring and rating these packages as like even triple A, like they're calling them perfectly safe, right? Yeah. And by the way, this is why the con is 16 hours or more at length <laughs> to, <laughs> to actually be able to explain all of these things um, in an understandable way to a lay audience uh, and such. But uh, yeah, that's uh, absolutely right. Uh, the critical thing that you need to know is that at every step of the way, as long as you don't tell the truth, it's a sure thing. And it's a sure thing because in addition to the arcane stuff we've discussed, and you're quite right, the idea is so that our eyes will glaze over and that, you know, politicians' eyes will glaze over and they'll refuse to do the hard work to learn how the con works and how to stop it, which is why in one era, when the regulators actually regulated and we actually created the prosecutions, we were able to contain essentially the same thing, 300 raging frauds. That's about how many frauds there were in this case. And of course, you're right in general, but you're focusing on the super powerful banks. There were tons of non-super powerful, non-politically astute bankers as well. Their banks failed. They were not bailed out. So we bailed out roughly 30 and we let roughly 300 fail that didn't have, they weren't so big that they were too big to fail. So it's a mixed bag uh, in those terms. And, but all of it's a bad bag, right? The, the treatment all along the way, either the firm dies through this fraud and potentially, you know, uh, all kinds of uh, dominoes fall in the system, or we have to bail them out to save them. In either event, we're the sucker in the market. And that's how they treat us. And unless and until senior government officials are actually willing to listen to this arcane stuff and learn not just about CDOs, but learn about accounting. Because that's where the real magic is. That's why it's a sure thing. And when you try to talk about accounting to people, they run from you, <laughs> you know, in horror. Like, well, well, no, no. What they, if you try to talk to politicians about accounting, they say, oh, let's bring in the experts. And they'll get the financial sector that engineered all this to, to tell them what to do. 
Um, yeah, that's the nicest interpretation uh, <laughs> of uh, what happens. So as as we ha- so now we've got the underlying fraud is is picking up steam as we head into '06 and then in, before the whole thing starts to crash. Now, if I understand it correctly, as as these loans get repackaged and work themselves up the food the banking food chain to the bigger and bigger institutions who start having enormous amounts of these toxic loans on their books, at some point the banks look at each other and and there's they're always loaning money from each other as part of just how they do business and raise you know short term capital and so on. But at a certain point, they look at each other and say, well, hold on. If I loan you money, I know most of your assets are BS. And then the other one says, yeah, well, when you want us to loan money to you, we know most of your assets are BS. And at some point, they don't want to loan money to each other. Is that kind of where the thing finally? Yeah. So as long as the bubble's expanding and what keeps it expanding for those 2003 to 2006, it's entirely liar's loans right? Subprime is actually falling after a while. Regular loans are falling. What is keeping the hyperinflation going? Why is that critical? Because as long as market prices, supposed market prices are rising, then the poetic saying in the industry works. A rolling loan gathers no loss. You just refinance it. And then again, remember the art is to make these loans, which are hyper risky, right? They're going to, they're so risky, they're going to lose money for the bank. You try to make them look like they're super safe. Well, how do you make sure? We define a life as a loan as safe if it isn't defaulting. But if we just refinance it, we can make incredibly crappy loans look safe. And then as you say, sooner or later, the music will end. Why? The, we can't hyperinflate the bubble anymore. Why? Right? That appears to be psychological with really? people. Eventually, folks, yeah, in the books, for example, there's a, a really good description, um, again, Michael Hudson in The Monster, of real estate guys. You know, these are the guys with the model homes trying to sell the development homes. And then just one day, instead of, on, you know, when Saturday comes, instead of having uh, 25 people, they're none. And they call their friends and they're none. So what had actually happened, uh, when I say psychological, we realize with some great delay. So the first thing that happens when real estate values start to fall is not much of anything because we don't want to take losses as homeowners. So we refuse to sell. And so the first thing you see is that market sales simply decline. And the average time that a home is on the market before it sells gets longer and longer. But then after six, nine months, more people have to move, right? They have to take that job on the other side of the country. And so they have to sell. And the only way they can sell is at a loss. And then again, some psychological level, people go, wait a minute, homes can go down in price. Homes can go down in price a lot. Yeah, people didn't believe that for quite some time. Eh? Right. That's, and that's, by the way, normal globally. It's not something unique to Americans. Um, we're pretty naive in uh, finance jargon about our own investments as regular people. You know, we hate to take losses on the home. So we're very resistant. And then, as I said, eventually people look around and they're seeing, no, this isn't real estate, you know, owning lots of homes, flipping them. This is not the way to profits anymore. This is a way to disaster. And those that, you know, folks who think they're the smart money start pulling back. I knew the disaster was imminent when I went to Las Vegas and every cabbie tried to sell me a home. They had a real estate agent. They owned two to three homes themselves, mm. right? They weren't, cabbies were just a, just a way to meet people to do to pursue their real estate careers. That's not tenable. 
that tells you it's on the last edges. But we don't really know what pushes to that day, you know, that, that fabled Saturday when the buyers essentially go on strike and say, no, you're crazy. But you're absolutely right about the, the next point. And this is the dark side of private market discipline. And again, this is why conventional economists claim that deposit insurance is the great Satan. You know, that it unhinges private market discipline because the creditors, overwhelmingly, of insured banks are us, the depositors. And we're fully insured. So why should we try to become the world expert on AmeriQuest, whether it's a good bank or a bad bank? But the dark side is the Merrill Lynch's of the world, the Goldman Sachs, they don't provide discipline. They provide cash. They fund the expansion knowing it's crap because they know as long as it's going up, they personally, not Goldman, they personally will make a ton of money. And so my metaphor is we've all gone to a picnic or a birthday party where that everyone got a bottle of water, right? And how many of us would drink that bottle of water if we knew that one in a hundred had been tampered with? It was unsafe. Long before fraud becomes recognized as ubiquitous, as soon as it gets into consciousness, as you say, the banker suddenly looks and goes, oh, F, what if they're doing what I'm doing? <laughs> well, they know crap, that. Fraudulent they know they assets. Are. And they know they are. They know they and are. So th they know they are. And so they say, uh, not in this place, mister. <laughs> no more, no more. I'm not going to buy your crap anymore. And as soon as they stop buying crap, then market makers begin to fail. So people don't much know about this category of folks. You know, they sort of just think that when you want to sell stock, there must be somebody on the other side of the trade that wants to buy the stock uh, at that same price. But even for really big companies with bazillions of shareholders, that's not true at particular times of the day. Uh, and such. And for most stocks, it's not even remotely true. And so we have these specialist companies that are way below the radar and they make markets. They buy. They, they'll take the other side of the transaction. If you want to sell your stock, they will buy. Well, that's fine. But what if you want to sell your stock because you know it's crap, right? It's based on uh, the, all this fraudulent mortgages that we talked about. Well, then the market maker, you know, buys and say they buy at 16, but then more and more of us try to sell. So what happens to the price? It collapses from 16 to eight. Well, now the market maker, which has a tiny, is a relatively tiny entity with not much capital, has bought all this stuff, this crap at 16, which is now at eight. So what is it? It's insolvent. And so the market makers start to fail in these circumstances. And that means that then you put in a bid to sell something uh, and nobody's on, the, you know, an ask and nobody's on the uh, opposite side. And if you can't sell an asset, what the hell is it worth? Right? Its supposed market value was 16, but now I can't even sell it for four. So markets tend to overshoot to in the down direction as well. And you got it exactly right. It's because basically the buyers go on strike because they don't trust the sellers anymore because the sellers look a whole lot like them in the mirror. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Exactly. And their portfolios them, look the, exactly like them. Them right? are us. <laughs> they We have seen the enemy. <laughs> and we are them. Right? We know, are the, them yeah. Okay, so thing. most most of this goes on the, the the period we're focusing on during the Bush Cheney administration. Uh, we're coming to the end of that administration. Th these guys that are at the top of these financial big institutions, as far as I can understand, are really damn smart. Many of them, I think, are probably sociopaths, but that doesn't preclude being really damn smart. 
they got to know that, you know, there's a cycle to this. They can start to see it coming. The Obama administration's coming in. Um, it, it can't, like, I, I, you can get into a little bit how Lehman Brothers kind of is the one that's gets the ball rolling, if I understand it correctly. But but I, I've always thought that Obama was, was what's the word, nurtured uh, right from very early on by finance. He got a lot of money in it from, to his campaign by the financial sector. And he comes, it's, he's just the right guy at the right time when it's time to bail them out. And, and they must have known all along that they were too big to fail, that they could blackmail uh, the American people, really, is what it amounted to. Uh, because if they weren't bailed out, it, it, unless they started nationalizing some of these big banks, which is what they probably should have done, uh, the whole thing would have unraveled. Um, there, there must be some consciousness in, on their part in how the next acts unfold. Well, again, remember that we have to be careful about the they. Um, so the they is not the companies. They don't, the companies are not human. They don't get to make decisions. They don't have fears or abilities. So as I said, most of the perpetrators are going to go bankrupt. Their, their banks are going to go bankrupt. But they'll walk away rich. And so the question is, are they going to be prosecuted? Because if they're not, it's just, again, a sure thing that people who are not particularly bright, right? This is not Wall Street. This is AmeriQuest. This is countrywide. But uh, wait a second. I isn't it by this point, all the big players are now involved? I mean, the, the food chain goes up to Goldman's and, and the rest of them. Sure. But AmeriQuest um, around 2006 is the largest maker of fraudulent loans in the world. Okay, this little tiny place, the one entity that escaped to the safety of the shadow financial se sector that was unregulated, if you let it grow for 14 years, again, it looks like a hockey stick. And so it's up there in the, you know, making nearly 100 billion uh, in fraudulent loans every year. One institution. So there are tons of folks like that. Now, they are not necessary. Countrywide was going to be too big to fail, but it was actually bailed out through a private uh, purchase with some government uh, backup. But what those people fear, they don't care about what happens to AmeriQuest. They only care what's going to happen to them, right? It's irrelevant to them whether it gets bailed out or not. And they correctly assessed that they had very little risk. Now, that's remarkable in some ways, because in the savings and loan debacle, there were well over a thousand convictions, and they were targeted at the most elite. And then what came next was the Enron era, where they were financially even more elite than the savings and loan folks. And there were roughly 800 successful felony prosecutions of those people. So if you went in predicting, you should have been predicting there was a significant danger that you've been prosecuted. Similarly, as I mentioned, until we get to Bear Stearns, which is early 2008, we had never bailed out with government funds an investment bank, right? That it would, was a no-no. And there's no reason to bail out an investment bank. You can let them fail, right? They're not federally insured, went the logic. Okay, so lots, you know, when we say they knew this was going to come, well, they maybe, but you had to be really damn prescient that things would change. Now, that brings us to Obama uh, and people like him. What, how much confidence would they have had? And that's interesting in itself, right? Because Obama as a senator, remember, he's only a one-term senator. But as a one-term senator, he had one of the, uh, I think, he, in fact, he had the highest rating in the standard liberal scores of any U.S. senator in America. And he talked about how banks were underregulated and uh, that we needed more resources to prosecute as a junior senator, right? 
So, you know, that part you wouldn't think would make him the obvious champion. Plus, the Clintons, remember, you're right, the biggest growth occurs under Bush, too. But the all the antecedents are under Clinton, right? So, in 1994, when uh, AmeriQuest is uh, allowed to escape to the shadow, and uh, the Fed has all the author authority to close it down, and Alan Greenspan refuses to do so. Well, who reappointed Alan Greenspan twice? You know, a rabid Ayn Rand Republican, Bill Clinton reappointed twice. Right. It's just insane. Just like um, Obama is going to reappoint Bernanke, the world's greatest failure as a financial regulator and uh, give us enormous promotion to Geithner who completely was supposed to regulate the biggest Wall Street banks and absolutely refused to even try to do that. The Clintons, by contrast, had been enormous, and both of them, enormously good to banking throughout their entire careers. People forget what started the Whitewater investigation. A criminal referral by a bank regulator. What do you think Bill Clinton thought about us? You know, <laughs> the instant view he had was the people that made my life a living hell. So he hated regulation with a purple passion. He cut the FDIC staff by more than three quarters. He cut the OTS staff by more than half. He launched an unholy war against regulators. In the first speech he ever gave to them, he had denounced them, saying he heard terrible things from campaign contributors about them. He openly talked about those kinds of things. In that light, after decades of service by the New Democrats, and again, both Bill and Hillary were independent forces in the New Democrat movement, which is the Wall Street wing of the Democratic Party and is openly the Wall Street win of the Democratic Party. They turned their backs on 20 years of faithful service by the Clintons and went with a junior senator who was black, which was relevant to his prospects of winning the damn election, because at the point they switched, everybody thought Hillary was a lock on the Democratic nomination and likely a lock to win the presidency. So in political science, you're taught you don't screw <laughs> them in those circumstances. But we know that Obama, even at this early time, had people who were vouching for him with Wall Street. Uh, so one of them will become his chief of staff, right? Daily. Another of them will, another of them will become the mayor of Chicago, Rahm Emanuel. A, a third, the Pritzkers, notorious predatory lenders, which have, we haven't really discussed the whole predation thing yet. Just awful, awful people. Completely the inner circle of the Obamas. So some or all of those three people clearly had the most amazing elevator pitch in the world because they went to bankers who were in the mutually in the pocket with the Clintons. And to the extent they weren't with the Clintons had historically been for Republicans. And for the first time in modern history, finance swung and gave Democrats more money than Republicans and gave it overwhelmingly to Obama instead of Clinton. So someone was able to give the word in a way that was believed by Wall Street, this is our guy. He Absolutely. will come through for us. And, and who do you want to be the face of bailing out Wall Street? Hillary or the guy with the, the probably the best smile since Ronald Reagan and maybe better than Reagan's, Obama's the guy that could sell the bailout. Hillary would have been a disaster. 
But again, they swung back against Obama, even though substantively he delivered enormously for them in that there were literally no prosecutions. I don't mean no convictions. I mean no prosecutions of any of the elite bankers who led any of the three fraud schemes uh, that drove the great financial crisis, right? But when he used that phrase, fat cats, I wasn't elected, you know, to uh, bail out a bunch of fat cats. It was like they were they were back to being 12-year-old males in junior high school in America. <laughs> he called us a fat cat. <laughs> you know, I'm a big effort, you know, big deal. How dare he uh, do that? And so the money actually swung to the Republicans in his second race and such. So you, they really demand you be beholden to them. Yeah. It isn't enough that you deliver on substance. They want you to talk the talk, not just walk the walk for them. Um, I, I know a guy on Wall Street uh, who's a mid-sized investor but, and donates to the Democrats. Uh, he was asked to donate to the Obama presidential campaign in the year 2000. They had, they were nurturing this guy for quite a while. Uh, at least that's what he told me. I had no reason not to believe him. All right, we're going to pick this up in the next segment. We'll talk about the Obama era, uh, the too big to fail. We'll get into predatory lending uh, and, uh, and the rest. So please join us for the next segment of our series uh, with Bill Black on the analysis. Don't Please don't forget there's a donate button. There's a subscribe button on YouTube. Uh, share the stories. And uh, we'll, we'll be back with the next installment of this uh, drama. Mm -hmm.